At Bedford Jail on April the 4th, 1962, James Hanratty was hanged for the A6 murder. I had no proof that he was innocent at the trial, but I felt he should never have been convicted on evidence of identification, which you could pull to pieces, and which I, who am only a doctor and not a lawyer, found fallacious in the extreme. Dr. So David Lewis, a Bedford specialist, attended the trial. He has been a member of the A6 Murder Committee ever since, a committee which campaigns for a public inquiry into Hanratty's guilt. I stood over on the other side of the road. I rode here on a bike, and there were a few people, a couple standing, one with judicial murder, with a notice of judicial murder, and I stood here waiting for the hour because I felt I had a loyalty, because I believed in his innocence, and I believed not for emotion, but on trial evidence. I'll say this now. The cartridges was laid in the Vienna Hotel to be found. Yeah. The gun was put on the bus to be found. Yeah. And this is, that was the setup. And that he was framed. Yeah. Definitely framed. The committee has been led by James Hanratty's father, an engineering worker in North London, and his wife Mary, who works in a soft drinks factory. Before their son's execution, Mr. and Mrs. Hanratty collected more than 20,000 signatures calling for a reprieve. Ever since, they have campaigned with meetings, leaflets and television appearances to reopen the case. Twelve months later, Elphon come to my house. He put his checkbook on my table. He says, Mr. Hanretti, let me compensate you for what has happened to you and your family. I then told him all the money in the world would not compensate me for what has happened to me and my family. At that time, I said, I want you to get up and get out of here, or otherwise there would have been a real murder done. Even if he's a not case, why isn't he brought in? Why is he allowed to, uh, to go and do just as he pleases? I've been inside, I'm only out two weeks inside, and straight up, you want to read his letter to the Home Office. He put his heart and his feelings into a letter. And that letter, if you read that from start to finish, that'll make you cry. And there's no man alive could put his feelings into a, a thing like that if he was not innocent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Thank you. you. Come along. Thank you. Thank you, come on. So I'd like you all to come and hear for yourselves in the regards to James Hanretti. Judge for yourselves, and that's all I ask you to do. There's 11 witnesses up in North Wales swear in all doubt that Hanretti was there on the night of the 22nd. The Home Office knows they got the evidence, but they just don't want an inquiry. Why? There was doubt at Bedford when they executed him. They know they've got the evidence. Lord Russell, Russell Lord Brockway, Miss Joan Lester, and 180 MPs say in Parliament James Hanratty was innocent. So come on January the 1st, fill up the town hall, and you'll hear all about it. One such meeting was held in Watford Town Hall on New Year's Day, 1969. More than 300 people came to the town hall to hear speeches from the committee. Why have we come along? Well, um, actually, I did it because um, I'm very interested in the Hanratty case, because I've uh, done some work at school um, on Hanratty. I do some project pieces on Hanratty. Very interested in the discussion of the case. Very interested. Why? Well, having read a, read a bit about it and, uh, and discussed it myself, but well, interesting. I like to hear other people's views on this point. There must be something about this inquiry, so I'll just come and find out. General attitude, really. You know, it's an interesting case, and um, especially after the recent um, abolition of hanging. And, um, I've seen a, a documentary on television, you know, mm -hmm. um, saying that um, all about the case, and I'm interested to hear further. Well, I'm against capital punishment. I know it's been abolished, but I'm still interested in this case. I'd certainly like to see his name cleared. Basically because I feel that uh, it was an injustice committed, you know, in, I don't think the trial was uh, properly conducted at all. I think basically an innocent man who was hanged. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Perhaps I can just uh, tell you that we do have with us um, several members of the Hanratty family. On my right, uh, Mrs. Hanratty, the mother of the executed boy, and on the extreme right, uh, his brother. On the left is Mr. Jean Justice. He is the one, really, who has kept this thing going 
through eight long, weary years. And on the extreme left, uh, Mr. Paul Foote, an editor of Private Eye and a well-known journalist. Well, perhaps it is only fair for me just firstly to briefly outline what the case is all about. In August of 1961, in fact on the evening of the 22nd of August 1961, somebody tapped on the car in which a couple, Valerie Storey and Michael Gregson, were sitting. He tapped on the window and pointed a gun in and made them move over and he got into the back of the car. About two hours later, the car drove off and they headed towards London. They stopped on a number of occasions, once for petrol, and all the time the gunman sat in the back of the car. Finally, they got to a lay-by on the A6 at a place called Dead Man's Hill. And here, the gunman suddenly shot Michael Gregson twice in the head. And he then uh, told Valerie's story to get the body out of the car. And having raped her, he fired a number of shots at her and left her for dead. The car then drove off and was found abandoned the following morning in Avondale Crescent at Ilford. Now, there was very little evidence for the police to go on. Valerie's story, in fact, survived that terrible ordeal. But she was in a very critical state. And a description was given of the murderer and a large-scale police hunt took place. Now, the first man to be brought in was a man called Peter Louis Alphon. He was eventually put on an identity parade and Valerie's story failed to pick him out. She picked out somebody else on the parade whom she later admitted looked a bit like Alphon, but she failed to identify Alphon as her assailant. And some weeks later, when she was in Bedford, then a second identity parade was held and on that parade, she picked out James Hanratty. Then, after one of the longest trials in English legal history, 21 days, and a judge's summing up lasting 10 hours, after the jury had been out for six and a half hours, they came back and asked for further guidance. And in fact, they were out for a very long period, and finally, a verdict of guilty was brought in. Now, many people at the time were very disturbed, and a large number of members of Parliament urged the Home Secretary to recommend clemency. This was Mr. R. A. Butler. But he refused to do so, and in February of 1962, James Hanratty was hung. Perhaps you could tell us a little about Jimmy, uh, what sort of a person he was, what sort of a life he led. Well, up until he was 15 years of age, he, he, he led a nice, normal life like any of the other sons. And from 15, 16, 17, he was in touch with France. He got in touch with France up in London, and from there he... He got into some very bad habits of housebreaking and, you know, he was on the fiddle all the time with France. But in the course of different periods, he'd come home and then go away again. But any time he'd done anything wrong, he'd never done it at home. He always went to London to, to do it. He went to prison a few times, didn't he? How many times did he go to prison? He went to prison, I believe it was three times, for car thieving. All the time it was for stealing cars. Stealing cars, cars yes. yes. There was no question of violent crime. No violence whatsoever, no. Sex crimes, anything No like sex that. crimes. He had some nice girls around here when he lived at home. He had several girlfriends and never had any complaints of uh, violence or sex or in, in any way. 
we are quite confident, absolutely certain, in fact, that he was innocent. We are quite certain that he was, in fact, on the night of the murder at Rill, 200 miles away. We are quite certain that Peter Louis Alphon, who has already confessed on French television to a crime, was in fact the killer. And we are confident that we know a great deal about the crime. What our committee is seeking to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to have a full public inquiry so that the whole of the case can be gone over and Hanratty's name can be cleared. On October the 14th, 1961, there was an identification parade of 13 men at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. From this identification parade, James Hanratty was picked out as the murderer by Valerie Storey, the only witness to the crime. The previous day, he'd been picked out by two other witnesses. One was John Skillet, a foreman, who said he had spotted the murderer driving a car alongside his own the morning after the murder. And James Troer, an engineering worker, who said he had seen the murder car that same morning and had glimpsed the face of the driver as it passed him. I am a story got my greatest sympathy because it must have been a terrible ordeal for the girl. But if I was on the bed for jury, not Mr. Hanretti, I don't think I could look at her identification at all. For previously, she picked out another man. And there they were, the 13 people, standing round Valerie Storey's bed, including Alphon, the man the police thought had done the murder. And Valerie Storey looks at them, and five minutes later, she says, there's a fellow who did the murder, number four. That's the bloke. Well, we've been trying for a long, long time to find out who this fellow is. We don't know who he is. There's a rumor that he's a Spanish sailor. Lucky for him that he's a Spanish sailor. Because if he wasn't a Spanish sailor, and if he hadn't got an alibi, if he couldn't remember where he was a month ago, he'd probably have been charged for the murder. He probably would have been hung. Because after all, Valerie's story was on Dead Man's Hill. She knew who was uh, the murderer. Now, to me, she couldn't have been so sure when she, pre when she first picked out that other man. Yes, so her identification really is, is vitiated to some extent by the fact that she picked out somebody completely different yes. and uh, when she about a month beforehand. Yeah, and when she picked out my son, after 20 minutes, he was yes. asked to speak to sound as THs. Acott said, ask them to speak. Superintendent Acott was in charge of the case. Repeat, be quiet, will you? I'm thinking. And the one with, who says thinking, that's him. Well, Hanratty was the only cockney on the parade, and he said thinking. The girl pointed to Hanratty, and Acott gripped her arm and said, well done, Valerie. Now, that should have never happened. He should not have been there whatsoever. When you look at the evidence with which he was convicted, it's fantastic. Fellow driving along a road, he comes down the road early in the morning. He comes, he sees a man go out into the road, and he comes up to him, opposite him, and he stops, and he winds down his window, he's the passenger in his car, winds down his window to shout abuse at the fellow there for coming out in the road. And he shouts the abuse, gets out of his chest, sees the fellow turn around and laugh, three seconds, possibly five, boom, they're away. Now there's two blokes in the car. One man sitting there, he goes up on the identification parade, and Ratty. He was the man in the car. The other fellow says, definitely wasn't Anne Ratty. So that was how, that's what, the other identification. The other fellow going to work, bit of a fly boy, a fellow called John Trower down in the East End. He's uh, easy with the police, you know, likes to keep in with the police, that kind of thing. He goes down and he's uh, walking up to knock on a fellow's door to get him to, to take him to work. He's knocking on the fellow's door, this is his story. He looks round, a car shoots by at 30 miles an hour. Now, I don't know if you've ever... I tried to identify a driver of a car going past you at 30 miles an hour at 7 o'clock in the morning. Have you tried it? But it's extremely difficult. I've tried it, actually. I've, I've stood for hours trying to remember a single feature of any driver I've seen going past at 30 miles an hour at 7 o'clock in the morning. I haven't tried it at 7 o'clock in the morning, but I've tried it at other times. And I tell you, it's absolutely impossible. You don't see a single thing. Now, this fellow picked up Hanratty. Oh, definitely, no question at all. Hanratty was driving the car. That's the kind of evidence he was convicted on. Absolutely fantastic. 
When Han Ratti read the newspaper reports that Superintendent Acott wanted him for the A6 murder, he also knew that he was being sought for housebreaking offences in the Ricelip area. And he knew if he gave himself up, he was going to get three years. So his only way was to keep ringing up Mr. Acott, which he did several times a day, and trying to clear himself of the charge which Mr. Acott or, or wanted him for. So, um... James Hanratty's brother, Michael. He made it plain that he wasn't going to give himself up for this, because of these housebreaking. And he said, it's ridiculous, this charge, with, or you want... I had nothing to do with this A6 business. I don't... I know nothing about it at all. When first arrested for the murder, Hanratty told police that he had spent the afternoon before the murder in Liverpool trying to sell stolen jewellery and had spent the night with three fences. And they said, oh, yes, what did you do? He said, oh, I got out of Liverpool Station and I was going to sell some stolen jewellery. And I got out at Liverpool Station and I put my case in the left luggage office and I went and had a cup of tea. And I wandered around looking for Tarleton or Talbot Road, where a previous prisoner friend of Hanratty uh, was believed to live. And he was asking people in the street, can you tell me where Tarleton or Talbot Road is? And all the rest. This is his story. He gets in a bus, he goes up to Scotland Road. And he gets some of the way up the Scotland Road, and he asks the conductor, I want to get off at Tarleton Road. The conductor says, I never heard of it. Get off here. So he gets off, and he walks across the road, and he goes into a sweet shop. And he says to the woman, but he, he sees there's an old lady behind the counter, and there's a little girl in the shop. And he says to the old lady, can you tell me where Tarleton or Talbot Road is? I'm not sure whether it's Tarleton or Talbot Road. And she says, well, I'm afraid I can't help you. And she asks, and uh, she thinks a bit about it, and then she says, no, I'm awfully sorry, I can't help you. So the fellow says, thank you very much, and he goes out. So he made up his mind to convince Mr. Acott, I'll just tell him uh, about the sweet shop and uh, other people he met in, in Liverpool and, um, and forget about the, the other side. So he only kept to the first part of the alibi. It wasn't until he told the defence that he'd gone into the Scotland Road, that the thing was investigated at all. And the police say, well, that'd be ridiculous. He was doing the murder. He couldn't have possibly... However, we'll carry out the inquiries. So the police go and make the inquiries. And the police go up the Scotland Road into the sweet shops. And they ask all the people in the sweet shops, oh, I don't suppose you've ever seen this fellow. He says he was coming on Scotland Road. And they come to a shop called Cully's. And there's a uh, the man there. He says, well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't here. Uh, on that day, uh, uh, my uh, si uh, uh, mother, my mother-in-law, was looking after the shop at the time. Perhaps you better go and see her. So they go and find the mother-in-law, who's a very respectable lady, called Mrs. Dinwoody. And she says, you know, it's an extraordinary thing, but a young man did come in here and ask the way to Tarleton or Torba Road. So this really sets the police back. They did. Well, because it couldn't have been the right day. It must have been some other time. He was thinking some other time. No, she said, as a matter of fact, I was only in that shop for two days, the 21st and the 22nd of August. So then the police get to work. And the police, uh, I don't know how it happened, but at any rate, she ends up by saying that it was on the 21st that Hanratty went into this sweet shop. So the prosecution then come and say, when the defence say, but he was in Liverpool, he was in the sweet shop, they say, oh, no, no, that was the Monday, the 21st. The Tuesday, the night of the murder, of course, he wasn't in that sweet shop at all. But the difficulty was that there were eight, no less, eight people came to the trial to say that on the Monday, Hanratty was in London. On the Monday, Hanratty was in London. Mr. and Mrs. France and their daughter, Carol France, and their dentist, Carol France's dentist who said that she'd had her tooth out and Carol France remembered the day because of the, 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 the tooth. You don't know who these names are, but I'm telling you that there are eight people who will s swore in court and whose evidence was not challenged in any way by the prosecution to say that Hanratty, throughout the Monday, when he was meant to be in Liverpool, asking the way to Tarleton and Talbot Road, was in London. So he was in London on the Monday. Plainly, he was in London on the Monday. And if he was in London on the Monday, it must have been on the Tuesday that he went into Mrs. Dinwoody's shop and asked the way to Tarleton or Talbot Road. They gave Mrs. Dinwoody a photograph of Hanratty. They said, is this the man? They said, sir, she said, certainly, that's the man. 
and she signed on the back. This is the man who came into my shop. The little girl, Barbara Ford, there, they said, do you think that's the man? She says, yes, that's the man. Signs on the back, Barbara Ford, the little girl, says that's the man that came into the shop. And it must have been the Tuesday. And if it was the Tuesday, and if he was in Liverpool in the sweet shop on the Tuesday at five o'clock in the afternoon, he couldn't have walked into the car at a cornfield and slough bucks at half past nine. Couldn't have done, as a matter of fact. The prosecution started to talk about helicopters. <laughs> no, seriously, you know. In the hearing at Antill, they said, well, could he have got a plane? Could we have the plane times? You know, well, uh, plane times didn't come out at all. There wasn't a plane that could get him there. And, you know, he's believed not to fly, although he had many remarkable qualities, and right, he couldn't fly there. And therefore, he was in Liverpool at the time. So the fact of the matter is that he was in Liverpool. The three fences in Liverpool, whom Manratti had first mentioned in his police alibi, were never found. Then, on the sixth day of the trial, Hanratty suddenly told his lawyers that he had, in fact, on the evening of the murder, travelled from Liverpool to Rill, where he had spent the night in a boarding house after looking round for lodgings. He felt, uh, I think it was the second week of the trial, that uh, things wasn't going as he, as, as he thought it would have gone. And Mr. Sherrod, as Hanratty's counsel, told him that he, he was going to put him in the box. And my son told Mr. Sherrod, well, he said, Mr. Sherrod, if I'm going in the box, I got to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I went to Liverpool. I went from Liverpool to Rio, and I stayed at this house in Rio with Mrs. Jones. Of course, I didn't know her name at that time. I, neither did he. Jimmy said he'd gone to Rio for what reason? Well, he had some jewellery. And according to what Jimmy told me, that the... Uh, chap in Rio that he went to see met him in prison and he told told Jimmy that if ever he wanted to get rid of any gear that he could always get him a, a buyer for it and get him a proper price. And this man was found, this man in Rio, he was, he was proved to exist. He did, yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Terry Evans. We went to Rio and we found 12 good witnesses there. It's really concrete said that Jimmy was there on the night of the 22nd of August. There was people in the fairground that seen him. There was a paper seller seen him. There was four houses that had been to. And the lady put him up. Now, this lady was the only witness that was brought to Bedford's side. There's four witnesses stands out that made statements before Hanratty's execution. And there's eight more that made statements to me and Lord Russell after the trial that Jimmy was in real. And those people told me themselves, beyond all doubt in their minds, that he was there. And all of them, I think, are, are prepared to go before a public inquiry and, and talk about it. And uh, sign an affidavit that he was there. The prosecution suggested that Hanratty's motive for the murder was sex that he had been consumed with lust for Valerie's story and that he had raped her at the point of a gun. And they tried to prove that this behaviour was consistent with his character. He never had a gun in his life. He'd never been convicted of any violent assault on anyone in his life and never had any problems at all with his sex life. So you say, here is this fellow with that kind of a record. And this is the man that they are saying is going into the back of a car, driving it into the cornfield, talking for two hours, getting the man who drives the car to drive it out of the cornfield, driving it round Buckinghamshire, Berkshire, all over the, uh, uh, right up to Luton, Bedfordshire, uh, and uh, five hour, for five hours driving, driving into a lay-by and then killing the man. Now, if he was a sex maniac, this murderer, if he was, he was a very patient one, wasn't he? Very patient one. Now, the point about this committee is that we know how this murder was done. We know how it was done. And we, we say, as Alphonse says, we, we know because Alphonse told us how it was done. Alphonse told several of us on the telephone. He told us face to face how it was done. And he says the secret to it is the relationship between Gregston and his wife and between Gregston and Valerie's story. Now that's a very sensible and intelligent motive. You see, when a fellow is uh, uh, murdered after sitting in a car with a girl that was not his wife, you. I would have thought that the first thing you think about is, what about a motive? What about his wife? And what about his wife's family? Now, what Alphonse tells us is that the murder was arranged, that the 
cornfield which Gregston and Valerie Story used to go to, they went to consistently over a period of four months. That the route they took from the pub to the cornfield was a consistent one, that everyone in the area knew that Gregston and Valerie Story used to go to that cornfield uh, in that car, night after night, night after night. And we are saying that Alphon was hired for money, that the intention was to break up the relationship between Valerie Story and Michael Gregston. The intention was to give them such a fright, to force Gregston out of the car, to interfere with the girl, and thus bring about the situation that the girl would refuse always to see that man again. That was the awful scheme which we say was proposed, and which ended accidentally in murder. Gregston, we believe, was shot accidentally, but of course Valerie Story was then shot on purpose because she was the only remaining witness to the crime. James Hanratty eventually became a suspect in the case because the night before the murder, he had stayed in room 24 of the Vienna Hotel made of veil, where two spent cartridge cases from the murder gun were found three weeks after the crime. We're saying that France got the gun and gave it to Alphonse and showed him how to use it and kept two cartridge cases back. We're saying that Alphon went out there and committed the murder accidentally, but then uh, shot uh, Valerie Story on purpose. Drove back, and then the machinery was set in motion, as it had been planned, to frame Hanratty, who was known to France and known to Alphon. That they deliberately framed him. That France put the gun under the back seat of a bus in London. So well, Mr. France, the committed suicide, that was Hanratty, supposed to be Hanratty's best friend, Unless he made a remark to him some months previous, if ever, he says to France, if ever you want to uh, hide any gear that you don't want, that's the only seat that lifts up in the bus, the back seat of the bus, which Mr. France said in Bedford Court. Had Ratty had told him that the back seat of a bus was a good place good to, place hide things. to hide things. Yeah. France put the gun there, he put the cartridge cases in the Vienna Hotel, and the hunt was then switched from Alphon, after she failed to identify him, to Hanratty. That's what we're saying. What gets me is that when the cartridge cases was found in the Vienna Hotel, in room 24, they, went, they wanted the man that stayed in room 6, which afterwards we found out who it was, was Peter Louis Alphon. On the night of the murder? On the night of the murder. He stayed there on the night of the murder. And he was put on an identity parade, which Miss Story failed to pick out. And I believe if she had have picked him out, that he would definitely be a dead one. Alphonse had behaved very suspiciously after the murder, and police had in fact launched a nationwide hunt for him, only releasing him when Valerie Story failed to pick him out of the first identification parade. Since Hanratty's execution, Alphon has in fact confessed to the murder several times, firstly in private and finally at a public press conference in Paris in May 1967. Peter Alphon took me and Jeremy Fox to the cornfield where the whole thing started near Slough at one o'clock in the morning in the fog and the ice in March. I didn't know the area, I'd never been there in my life. He was able to say, we've stopped here. I left something in the field. I was able to identify it later. I said to him, did you shoot Gregson? He said, yes. I said, did you shoot and rape Valerie Story? He said, yes. He said, Mr. Hanratty, I want to co I've come here today to compensate you. Let me compensate you for what has happened to you and your family. I never thought for one moment that they'd have had enough evidence to do as they've done to your son. Every effort was made to get a reprieve. Alphonse said, I cannot give myself up. It's my life or his. And he said, I'm more important. I've got a mission in life and Ratty is expendable. Well, I don't have to tell you how I felt that night. Right up to the evening of the execution, Peter Alphon was in the house with myself and Jeremy Fox and my brother Frank were in the same building. Fenner Brockway was there till four o'clock in the morning in his pajamas, ringing up the home office. They sent home office officials round. 
and Scotland Yard officers. They said, where's Alphon? I said, he's upstairs. They looked at their watch. They said, keep him there. We'll be back. They never came back. They were playing for time. Meanwhile, the last few hours of Hanratty's life were ticking away. And Alphon, who was later not only to threaten me till I had to get police protection, but various people from Lord and Lady Russell to God knows who, year after year, that night he was very much afraid. We are going to go on with this campaign. We're going to go from here to Slough and we're going to go to other areas and we're going to write books and go on until this uh, man's name is cleared, until the rotten corruption which went into the framing of uh, James Hanratty and the legal finding of him guilty and his execution uh, is shown up once and for all. <clears throat> I just want to ask, you've uh, very neatly painted Arcot as some sort of intriguer who was determined to frame Hanratty from the very start. Can you answer me two questions? Firstly, what possible motive can you conceive um, would he have for going to these lengths to frame Hanratty or to make sure the case actually stuck? And secondly, what possible motive is there for such a gargantuan um, official cover-up that seems to have taken place? Now, look at it as it was at the time. And those of you that remember it will remember this, that the A6 murder got more publicity after the murder than perhaps any other crime since the war. That it got fantastic publicity. I've just spent several weeks going through the newspaper cuttings, and it is fantastic the way the newspapers treated this thing. First of all, for instance, she said that uh, um, it was a hitchhiker. And you remember that hitchhikers throughout the land find it impossible to get lifts for about three weeks until afterwards it was actually found out that he wasn't a hitchhiker, that he'd, he'd barged his way into the car. Now, it was imperative that the police, if they were to appear as an efficient force, should find the man who'd done this crime. It was imperative that they should do it. And therefore, I think that the rigging is not an immediate malicious operation started from the moment that they dropped off on. I believe that certain evidence pointed to Hanratty. They went for Hanratty, and when they found they couldn't stand up an alibi immediately, they determined to get it. And therefore, whole sections of evidence which were, uh, appeared to be in favor of him were twisted and rigged. In the death cell, I spoke to my son for 90 minutes, and I asked him, if there was anything else he wanted to tell me. And he says, Dad, there is only one thing I want to tell you. I did not do this crime that they're going to, they've pinned this on me, that I'm going to face tomorrow morning. And I want you, Mum, Richard, and Peter, and Michael, never let anybody say wrong against me. I want you to clear my name. Well, I walked out of the condemned cell, and I know I've known my son from a baby. He would not have put that on, on his family or on me to clear his name. He'd have told me, Dad, I've let you the family down. Forget about me. Nobody would have been the wiser but myself. Now, when I come out of that dead cell, I thought to myself, well, there's something wrong. Seriously wrong here. I'm a man. I've never been against capital punishment. If a man does a crime, he deserves all, whatever the country may put upon him. But beyond all doubt in my mind, I am convinced for in this last eight years what I have learned from different sources in the country that my son had no connection with this crime whatsoever. He was definitely framed. This is the last letter that uh, Jimmy wrote to Michael. Well, Nick, dear Mick, well, Mick, I'm going to do my best to face up in the morning with courage and strength. And I'm sure God will give me the courage to do so. Mick, now you are the eldest in the family, I'm counting on you to look after the family. I know that I could not count on anybody better than yourself. Mick, we always got on well together, and we had many good times together over the years. But I'm going to ask you to do me a small favour. That is... I would like you to try and clear my name of this crime. Someone, somewhere, is responsible for the crime. And, and one day, they will venture again. Then the truth will come out. And then, Mick, that will be your chance for to step in. 
I feel the police will try to hush it all up if they get the chance. So Mick, I'm counting on you to keep your eyes on the paper. Well Mick, that it is at the time is drawing near. It is almost daylight, so please look after Mum and Dad for me. As you could not wish to have better parents than ones you have got. I only wish I could have had the chance all over again. But never mind, Mick, as I don't know what I have done to deserve it. But Mick, that is paid for you. Thanks for all the trouble you have been. So can I assure you that you have not been wasting your time, as it will all help to bring out the truth in the end. And Mick, don't let anyone say a bad word about me. I feel I have to say goodbye for now. Give my best wishes to Mum and Dad and all the family, your loving brother Jim.